Welcome to the annual Bike Roundup and Repair Clinic, sponsored by the students from the local middle school. This group is doing the repair work, but that's just one piece of the pie. There's also a safety demonstration and an obstacle course for all the riders. To pull off an event like this, a lot of different people have to work together. And that means learning to understand each other and our differences. When it comes to understanding differences among people, often that means understanding world religions. Today we're going to talk about Buddhism. There are more than 360 million Buddhists living all around the world today. That's about 6% of the world's population. Most of today's Buddhists live in China, Japan, and Southeast Asia, although their numbers are growing in the United States and Europe. The Buddhist religion is named for its first teacher, the Buddha, or Enlightened One. His followers believe the Buddha was enlightened because he was awakened from ignorance and realized the truth about life. That great enlightenment came about 2,500 years ago to a prince who left his family and possessions to achieve it. According to Buddhist tradition, Siddhartha Gautama was born around 563 BCE near the Himalayan mountains in what is now the country of Nepal. He was a prince raised in the palace of his father. Siddhartha's father wanted his son to be happy, so was careful never to let him see anything in the world that might make the boy feel sad. But when Siddhartha grew up to be a young man, he wanted to see more of the world than just the inside of a palace. So one day, he left and wandered the open road. On his journey, Siddhartha saw four things that changed his life. For the first time, he saw an old, old man and realized that all people grow old. He saw a sick man and realized that there is pain and sickness in the world. He saw a funeral procession and realized for the first time that living things die. He realized that there was much suffering and sadness in the world. Finally, he saw a religious man who had given up all of his possessions yet seemed happier than the people who owned many things. And so Siddhartha decided he would give up everything he had, his father's riches, even his own wife and child, and search for answers to the question of why there is suffering and sadness in the world. Siddhartha exchanged his fine clothes for the long robes of a monk a holy religious man. Siddhartha lived a life of poverty for six years. He went without food and sleep so that he could understand what it felt like to be hungry and tired. He became very thin and nearly starved to death. But he felt no closer to the answers he was looking for. Siddhartha realized he was not going to gain the truth by denying the needs of his body. From then on, Siddhartha chose what he called the middle path. Neither the self-indulgence of his life in the palace, nor the extreme self-denial of his life in poverty. Instead, he chose a life of moderation. Living this way, he was able to think calmly and clearly about the answer to his question of why there was so much suffering in the world. This kind of calm and focused thought is called meditation. Siddhartha found his answer one night while meditating under a tree. He came to understand the truth about suffering, what causes it, and how to stop it. Siddhartha realized that suffering is caused by desire or wanting. Buddhists call this moment the Great Enlightenment. Siddhartha was now the Buddha, the Enlightened One. Buddhists believe that for the next 45 years, the Buddha devoted his life to teaching others about what he had discovered. In the thousand years following the death of the Buddha, his teachings spread and took firm root beyond his homeland. As Buddhism spread, it changed to reflect the different cultures of the new lands it reached. The religion split into many branches. The two largest became known as Theravada Buddhism and Mahayana Buddhism. Theravada Buddhism is concentrated in countries like Sri Lanka, Thailand, Cambodia, and Laos. Mahayana Buddhism is practiced primarily in Tibet, China, Korea, and Japan. 
those two branches, Theravada and Mahayana, remain the dominant forms of Buddhism in the world today. Did you hear what was at the heart of the Buddha's great enlightenment? The Buddha realized that people suffer because of desire or wanting. So the practice of Buddhism revolves around recognizing those wants and getting free from them. Michelle, Lalita, and Peony will perform a blessing dance in the Thai tradition. Some of the Buddha's core teachings guide them and other Buddhists in their daily lives. An important part of the Buddha's teaching is called the Four Noble Truths. The first noble truth is that suffering is a part of life. The second noble truth provides the reason for suffering. Suffering comes from desire. Like wanting to be popular. And to be liked by a certain group of people. The third noble truth is the belief that there is an end to suffering. The Buddha said that if people stop wanting, they won't suffer anymore. The fourth noble truth speaks of the ways to end suffering. This is called the Noble Eightfold Path. In the Noble Eightfold Path, the first step is right understanding, which means understanding the Four Noble Truths. Two, three, and four are right thought, right speech, and right action, which mean thinking, speaking, and behaving in a kind and compassionate way. You know, no gossip, no bullying. It's very important in the Buddhist way of life to act unselfishly and to put the needs of other people first. Number five is right livelihood, which means choosing work that doesn't hurt people or other creatures or our environment. Six, seven, and eight are right effort, right mindfulness, and right concentration. These have to do with meditating and trying to free your mind. Replacing selfish or evil thoughts with good ones. The Four Noble Truths and the Noble Eightfold Path are used daily in our life because they teach us how to be good people. Um, when like my brother gets me mad because he breaks my hair stuff or he ruins my homework, I'll just think about that and how I have to be kind to other people. The Four Noble Truths and the Noble Eightfold Path are important parts of the Buddha's many teachings known as the Dharma, the doctrine or law of Buddhism. Remember we learned there are two main branches within Buddhism, Theravada and Mahayana. To understand today's Buddhists, we have to understand the key difference between those branches. Theravada Buddhists try to remain close to what they believe are the oldest original teachings of the Buddha. Theravada Buddhists believe that each person, individually, has the ability to reach enlightenment by understanding the Four Noble Truths and following the Noble Eightfold Path. Mahayana Buddhists believe that people need help if they're going to achieve enlightenment. Mahayana Buddhists believe help can come from people who have achieved enlightenment, including the Buddha himself, and that anyone who is working to achieve enlightenment should also be helping other people reach the same goal. Men and women who are already enlightened and have dedicated their lives to helping others are known as bodhisattvas. There are some shared beliefs most Buddhists do have in common. One is the great importance of compassion, being unselfish enough to put the needs of other people ahead of your own. Another is the belief in a continuing cycle of life. This group of young artists draws on their beliefs and discusses the details of the Buddhist tradition. We believe that when a person dies, it's not the end of everything. Life is an endless cycle of birth, life, death, and rebirth. After death, we might be reborn as a human or some other animal. Which could be a dog, cat, or even a spider. This rebirth is called reincarnation. Buddhists believe our future lives depend on the karma we create in this life and past lives. Karma refers to everything we think, say, and do. How we behave in this life affects what will be in our next lives. If we help others and treat all beings with compassion, we can ascend to the heavens. But ultimately, Buddhists hope to escape the continuing cycle of birth and death, which brings suffering, and to reach nirvana, a state of being where there's no more suffering and no more rebirth. 
Being human is thought to be the best rebirth from which to reach nirvana. We believe that the Buddha was the first person to reach nirvana. As Mahayana Buddhists, we believe that there are countless Buddhas and countless Bodhisattvas. Buddhas are fully enlightened, while Bodhisattvas are partially enlightened beings who are practicing to become Buddhas. Monks, nuns, and even ordinary people can attain enlightenment, but it may take many lifetimes to become a Buddha. The Buddha himself practiced as a Bodhisattva for numerous lifetimes before achieving Buddhahood. A Bodhisattva is someone who chooses not to become a Buddha until every other living thing is also enlightened. That's why Bodhisattvas are so important. They help guide others to enlightenment. For example, there's a Bodhisattva named Guan Yin, or Contemplator of the World Sounds, who has vowed to save living beings from suffering whenever they recite her name. Mahayana Buddhists believe that the spirits of past religious leaders are still active in the world too. Spiritual leaders help keep a religious tradition alive, providing an example of devotion and guidance in interpreting religious teachings. For many Buddhists of Tibet, the spiritual and political leader is known as the Dalai Lama, and his teachings are known throughout the world. Dalai Lama means teacher whose wisdom is as great as the ocean. Tibetan Buddhists believe that the first Dalai Lama lived about 600 years ago. Tibetan Buddhists believe that each time the Dalai Lama dies, he is reincarnated as a great spiritual leader. One of the most important spiritual leaders of our time has been the 14th Dalai Lama. He was born in 1935 in Tibet. In the year 1950, as the Dalai Lama assumed his role as political leader of his country, Tibet was invaded by communist China. As a result of threats on his life and the desire to continue to aid his people, he escaped to India to live in exile. In the years following, he remained both a spiritual leader and an inspiration to his people in Tibet and around the world. Buddhists also have spiritual leaders in their own communities. This tradition started during the time of the Buddha. Following his enlightenment, the Buddha devoted his life to teaching a community of followers known as the Sangha. Today, the Sangha is made up of monks and nuns, and often other believers called lay people. This community is so important to Buddhism that the Sangha, the Dharma, and the Buddha are sometimes called the Three Jewels. Monks and nuns of the Sangha live in a monastery where they can devote their lives to following Buddhist teachings. For the Mahayana tradition, community service requires using the hands as well as the head and the heart. In the Theravada tradition, the monks serve their community by working to achieve wisdom and understanding, which enriches the life of the community. And in some countries, it's a tradition that often begins at a very early age. Two Buddhist monks, the Venerable Abbot Pisano Bhikkhu and Sudanto Bhikkhu, tell us about monastic life. Buddhist monastery provides a peaceful place for the entire community. It's also a place to practice the teachings of the Buddha. The Buddha is sort of seen as the uh, example or the image of uh, one who is truly awakened, uh, who is completely wise, re reflect on the qualities or chant on the, the qualities of the, of the Dhamma. These are qualities of, of truth. We shave our heads and wear robes, just like the Buddha did. It's a chance to meditate and study in a monastery. The rules the monks follow are based on the five moral precepts of Buddhism. We vow not to harm any living thing, not to steal or take that which is not given, to practice self-restraint, not to speak unkindly, and to abstain from the use of drugs or alcohol. The rules are strict here. We have 227 in all. We meet twice a month to declare what rules have been broken and to make confession. When we become monks, we train ourselves to be content with little. We simplify our lives and rely on dana, which are gifts of food, clothing, and other necessities. Dana is given freely by the lay community. We choose a simple life so we can focus on developing a peaceful heart. We meditate, teach people about Buddhism, and serve as an example for others to follow. 
Buddhist nuns Hung Liang and Hung Yin and novice Guo Fang tell us about monastic life in their community. It is said that the Buddha founded an order of nuns during his lifetime, and in some countries they've continued to flourish. In the Mahayana tradition, our duties include community service, such as teaching and helping the elderly and youth of the community. We're also translating ancient scriptures into other languages, and we're using some very modern technology. This is a task that began thousands of years ago. The task of collecting and distributing Buddhist sacred writings, called sutras, began hundreds of years after the Buddha's death. Like many of the great religions, the earliest followers first handed down the sayings of their leader by word of mouth and wrote them down much later. When members of the Sangha wrote down the Buddha's words, they didn't write on paper. They used the leaves of palm trees. They kept the palm leaves in baskets. These writings are part of Buddhist traditions, sometimes called the Tripitaka, which means three baskets. The Tripitaka contains the Buddha's words and his guidelines for living. Both Mahayana and Theravada Buddhists create spiritual places, especially for thinking about the teachings of the Buddha and for prayer and meditation. For centuries, Dharma wheels have turned in Buddhist lands. Monasteries in Tibet often housed rows of large Dharma wheels powered by wind, water, or human hands. Spiritual leaders of Tibet, called lamas, and lay people alike have similar wheels which they turn in prayer. Each revolution of the wheel releases the special blessings of the sacred text and mantras contained within. Great masters have taught that these blessings have the power to clear away obstacles to enlightenment and to harmonize the natural environment. Tibetan Buddhists place prayer flags outside their homes, temples, and other spiritual places. Didi's family is from Thailand. They are Theravada Buddhists. My family has a shrine, a place set aside for prayers and devotion in our house. It has a small statue of the Buddha and other things important for prayer, like candles and flowers. We can pray here anytime. My family sometimes visits a temple to pray. Buddhism gives me like a framework. It doesn't control who I am or how I live my life, but it tells me like, this is how you be a good person. Because they always teach about being in the middle of everything, and so you don't want too much of something or too little of something, and that's how I focus my life and try to be a good person. Inside is a place devoted to the respect of the Buddha. Temples often have statues of the Buddha and other objects to remind us of him. When we go to the temple, we bow in front of the Buddha to show our respect. There's a small fig or Bodhi tree. That's the same kind of tree the Buddha sat under at the moment he gained enlightenment. Today, we're going to burn incense. Incense symbolizes concentration. On other days, you might leave offerings of candles to represent the light of wisdom, or flowers to remind us of the beauty in living a good, virtuous life. I come here all the time, every Saturday and Sunday when I don't have school, to learn Thai dance with my friends, and my closest friends are here, and. All my mom's friends are like my aunties, and so coming here is like a second home to me. The lotus flower symbolizes enlightenment. In this statue, the lotus is the Buddha's throne or seat. His long ears are signs of compassion. The Buddha can hear the cries of all living beings that are suffering. Different statues show the Buddha's hands in different positions. This one shows the moment of enlightenment. The Buddha touches the ground with one hand, calling the earth as witness. By something as simple as a gesture of the hand, we see symbols of meditation, reassurance, and compassion. When the Buddha passed on, his followers collected his bones and teeth. These relics are kept in bell-shaped mounds called stupas. 
Some stupas are multi-leveled towers called pagodas. There are thousands of stupas and pagodas all over Asia, some with relics and some with holy writings and statues or pictures. People visit stupas and pagodas to feel closer to the Buddha and to celebrate his life. We've learned a lot about the two main branches of Buddhism, but there are many more traditions sprouting from those two branches, shaped by the cultures of different countries. You can see the rich variety of traditions by taking a look at some of the Buddhist holidays. Every year, many Buddhists in Japan celebrate a festival called Obon. The holiday of Obon is influenced by many religious and cultural traditions of Japan. Lanterns are often lighted and hung outside Buddhist homes because many believe the light guides the spirits of ancestors. To celebrate, Buddhists often perform special dances, light bonfires, and gather for feasts that bring families together. Vesak is the day Buddhists celebrate the Buddha's birth, enlightenment, and death. Buddhists celebrate Vesak in May on the day when the moon is full. Many Buddhist festivals fall on the days when the moon is full, when many of the main events in the Buddha's life happened. On Vesak, there's always dancing in the streets. There's no dancing in the streets going on here, but we're making our own kind of fun and teaching some good lessons in the process. And it's not just lessons on how to ride bikes. This is a great big demonstration of teamwork and working together to help other people. Whatever path people choose to find what's right for them, the journey goes better for everyone when we try to understand each other and our differences.